Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of From Page to Stage. I'm your host, Wendy Corner, and this, this podcast is for authors. Now, if you are an author, you've got your page done. Maybe you've already done the stage. You're, you're happy in both camps. Great. You will get some lovely gold from this. Maybe you've done the page, but you're not quite so comfortable with the stage yet. This is also for you because you'll get some inspiration from people who've already done this. And also we're having interviews with people who are in that, what I call aspirational level. They've got the page, they're working towards the stage. So it is easily done. So welcome along to you. And today I have the absolute joy and privilege of introducing to you Graham Robinson. Now, Graham has put out a very powerful book at the end of last year, 2023. Now, I could do a bit of an introduction, but you know what? He knows himself a lot better than I do. So, Graham, can you keep the cliff notes? How did you get to where you are now? Hi, Wendy. Nice to be on your podcast. Thank you. I um, So, it's about a five-year journey. It um, started initially with one of my daughters hearing that I'd left home at the age of 13 and left school. And she's very like, much like me. She thought, oh, that's a good idea, which I had to dampen down very quickly. Um, but then she said, what happened? Can you tell me what happened? And I suggested, OK, I'll put it in diary form. Mm -hmm. And um, because there are a lot of things that happened that aren't always necessary, necessarily pleasant, and I was a bit embarrassed about some of those for her to read. Um, so, but when I started that, I realized that the story just, the words just kept coming. Um, I started to remember back to when the first incident that caused me to get to this point at five um, and all of the things in between. It's funny, sometimes I can't remember somebody I've just met five minutes ago, but I can remember what happened, you know, over 50 years ago. Um, so I... Um, I started to write it in a more detailed version and then I joined a book club or a, a writer's club actually um, and um, they started to give me some advice and started to bring me along and then I started to realise that it needed to be written as a proper novel, as a book, um, to really deep, dig into it. And um, so my decision was because I wanted to take people on an I wanted to take them inside what happened to me on an emotional ride. Mm -hmm. I've written it as an, what's known as a narrative memoir. Okay. So it's a story. Um, I haven't written it as I did this or this happened to me. There are parts of that. So I'm referencing why um, as a kid of 13, I leave school and um, I go and find work. And then I end up in Sydney in Australia alone and broke and at the mercy of a whole range of people. Um, and so that all unfolded as a story. And I write it in the second person to try and take people into it. So as uh, you and, and so forth, rather than I or them. Okay. But mm. yeah, it's uh, quite a long journey. I must admit, um, writing a book is a very interesting, a very interesting process. And mm -hmm. um, it's not just the process of writing, it's understanding how you should write. It's all the how you should use dialogue, how you should mm -hmm. try and keep the um, the reader in, engaged with you, the length of it's a whole range of things that you learn, which are fascinating. And that I mean that's that's purely from the technical writing thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering, did you actually have almost like a cathartic growth experience as you were working through the material? So my my book is really about loss of childhood. It's about childhood trauma and and the loss. Of, that, that's why I called it pain, loss, and desire because it's in three sections. Okay. Um, so um, the the uh, however, I didn't know very much about inner child trauma when I began writing. I thought that you know your father beating you and and so forth and the lack of love in a house um, was just what it was. That that's my life. That's 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 how it is. As I wrote, um, 
it wasn't so much the words on the page, but what it did was it built, it started to open up emotions inside me. So I would be sitting watching the television and somebody would come on, a father would come on, and he would put his arm around his son and hug him. Now, in my whole life, that never happened to me. And so I would just break down and cry. I would sob. And I started to realise that something was going on here that I didn't understand. So I started to seek help for myself whilst I was writing the book. And um, I met a lady who started to do some work with me and that's when she started to bring in the inner child work um, and talk about inner child trauma. And, of course, that led me to not only exploring that more in the book, so I wrote an initial version and I went back to square one. Once I started to understand that this, you know, um, my incident commenced at five in Sandringham Forest in, in England with my father with a leather belt. Um, so that, even then, I remember realising, sitting in the car after that beating when he was driving home, I realised that this was no longer a safe place. And I'm five. And I can remember looking out the window thinking, how do I escape at five years of age? Mm -hmm. And and so it went... the the. And, and although it wasn't a thought about I could do anything about it, it was just I was actually watching, believe it or not, butterflies on on because um, it was summertime. I was watching them in, the, in on the plants and thinking how free that looked and realising that I wasn't. That, that's the sort of and thing. you were five. Like, yeah. yeah I, you see, I remember those incidents clearly. And then... Mm. Um, and then from there, there were a whole series of events of, of that sort of thing. I mean... I, I found that if in any way I embarrassed my father, if I did something that embarrassed him, then he would react very badly. For example, um, we um, went to Africa to live, and we went by in those days, like we're talking uh, 60s um, uh, when we went out, we went by ship, by p &O ship. I think it was the Arcadia that we were on. And in those days, when they crossed the equator, they have a special opening of the pool, like they have a whole event, a uh, guy dresses up, does all that. So all the kids, myself included, were all lined up waiting to jump in the pool because it hadn't been opened until then. And um, as he opened up the pool, it, all of us rushed forward. But as I jumped in the pool, the ship rolled. And so the water sloshed to one end. And as I jumped, it came back and it knocked me under to the bottom of the pool. Um, I remember my brother jumped in, another man jumped in fully dressed and they dragged me out and they put me on the side of the pool and I, I remember rolling over and, and, and throwing up some water and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And the man who, who jumped in, he said um, he should be taken back to his cabin and, mm -hmm. and looked after, or, or he didn't say looked after, but, but dried. Mm -hmm. And so my father and mother were there watching. Um, so they led me to the cabin and my father rolled up the towel and started to whip me. So that's his reaction to me causing him embarrassment in front of all the others. And then they locked me in the cabin for the rest of the afternoon, which wasn't, at least I was safe. Mm -hmm. So that's the sort of material, that's the sort of stuff that I was writing about that brought up the emotions. Um, and um, there, there's a lot more of not so much even that. By th I realised that... Um, as a kid um, in England, I would I would um, play in forests in the summer, play in the fields in winter, just be out of the house because I felt mm. safe. When we were living in Africa, I would do the same thing. I'd run, I'd go into the bush. I mean, I I went into the bush one day and I was I was um, I, I went for quite a walk and I remember there was this big pigsty, huge sow with little piglets in it and. I, I yeah I was just watching it. and then I went and walked up some what they call copies which are just small hills um not not too hard to get up so I'm lying on that my back in the sun and it's just felt great and some baboons came over the other side of the copy and and the ma the male baboon started opened up his mouth and started um sort of running towards me I I still I don't think he wanted to attack he wanted to get me off away away from the the other family you but, were in his territory. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But he was big and I was terrified. So I'm sliding and rolling down the hill and he's sort of coming a little way down. And anyway, I get to the bottom and I look up and he's standing there, you know, 
and and this big baboon. And but I guess what I'm saying is that that was even safer to me than being in my house. I felt better being out, even though I took chances and there are lots of things that that occurred. Um, but no wild animals attacked me. Um, just um, um, but it was just safer. It was just it was just better for me as a kid and. When I left school and left home, um, it was because again um, I had um, I had some friends and I was at a dance and um, some friends pulled up in in a car and I was too young to drive but I knew some older friends. This is in Darwin in in mm -hmm. Australia um, and it's a very small town when it comes to to you know knowing everybody mm -hmm. and um, I knew he was drunk. Um, you know, you could smell it from the car, um, oh but I still, and there was another friend I knew in the front seat as well, um, but I still got in the car because by that stage, there was an element, I, I don't know if I could say I didn't care whether I lived or died. I wouldn't go that far, but I knew that I would take risks. It right. didn't matter to me. And so I got in the car. Um, we screened down the hill heading towards um, a Darwin Oval. He, lose, he comes up on a car too fast, loses control, and there's these huge coconut trees along this beach entrance, and we smash into that, tears the car nearly in half. Um, interestingly, um, well, I, 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 I cut my head on the roof um, because I was thrown forward and we hit the roof, and my knee was hurt because the seat jammed up altogether. But right. the, Billy, who was in the front seat passenger, his, I, I remember watching his head crash against the tree through the window um oh. the driver got a bruised hip that was it that's all he got um it was a big old valiant so it was a strong car it was a solid mm. vehicle um but um so anyway when i uh, the next morning i went home uh, a friend at the hospital took me home a guy called philip who became quite a quite a friend um and next morning i'm all bandaged up and there's still blood seeping through the cut on my head and i'm so i'm, I'm hobbling down down the passageway because I knew I had to get out of the house before they saw it but I, I didn't know what I was going to do after that anyway my mother comes around the corner and she starts screaming and my father comes around the corner and then it ends up he starts to threaten me and it just so it's that sort of element that um drove me out so anyway mm. um I, I left home so that's how it all began because my daughter heard that I'd left home at 13 and she um, as I say, wanted to know why. And I could see in her eyes thinking, oh, I wonder if I could leave as well. How old was your daughter when she asked this question? Was 13 or 14. <laughs> the yeah. same age. And yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and then, you know, um, the, the writing of the book, as I explored it more, I really enjoyed delving into it and writing. And and it's interesting. I, um, I ended up in Sydney, broke and alone, living in the People's Palace. And then I was forced out of that because of an incident that happened with a friend I'd met. Um, he was about the same age as me, blonde hair, but I, I saw him walking down the steps of the people wearing a red top hat. Was the most, un yes, was the most interesting sight I've ever seen. Um, Billy's name was a lovely guy. And we, anyway, he was similar age and I hadn't met anybody really. Philip had left, taken all the money um, and left me in Sydney. And obviously I couldn't drive. I never thought about going home though never occurred to me I didn't don't even know if I knew how I could get home never thought about a bus or anything like that why would Just, you, you sorry want to why would you want to go back that, that's right and exactly I didn't have anything there and and even though I had virtually no money um but um so Bill um found um he he disappeared for a little while and then came back and he um had told me of a boy's boarding house that he'd come across in Lakemba, where the lady, um, if you paid for a week's rent, she fed you and looked after you, and all boys around a similar age. Mm -hmm. um, so she took them in from, uh, I guess, social services, whatever mm -hmm. it was called then, but also other other boys. But I had no money. I had about $5 left. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing, sometimes I believe very much that when things are ready for you they put in front of you when when something to help you and, and to not help you um for example I, I went for a dishwashing job in a in a restaurant called um um 
uh, Carl's restaurants in Double Bay. Now in Sydney, Double Bay is exclusive, especially in those days. And okay. Carl's restaurant is very exclusive. Um, but anyway, I was there for an interview and, and the, the man behind the bar said, oh, look, I'm sorry, the job's gone. And he must have, something on my face, because I, I nearly cried, because I really needed money. Mm. And then anyway, he offered me a meal in the restaurant, because there was no one there. He said, the chef's still here. Come in, sit down, I'll get you a steak. You look like you could do with one. Mm. Um, and the waitress, when she picked up the empty plate, she left me a $20 note, which, you know, we're talking 1970, 71, and that really mm. was quite a bit of money. Yes. It helped me feed. And Richard, the guy who'd been uh, the manager who was behind the bar, he offered to help me if I needed. And, and eventually I did need some help mm -hmm. from him. But what I was going to say, on the way driving down from Darwin to Sydney, we picked up this hitchhiker, a man in his probably 40s, 50s, who'd been to a rodeo. His name was Reg. True blue Aussie, he'd been a ringer and he was a lovely man. And um, he loved to sleep out. I mean, I remember we slept out in the, under the stars and he loved it, a great guy. And when we got to Sydney, um, he um, he and Philip didn't quite get along, but he and I did. It was like a okay. yes. And now when I look back at it, I, I think that it was probably my closest to a father figure that I had. Right. You know, somebody who actually cared uh, that much. When we got to Sydney, Reg said goodbye and he, he pulled me aside and he said, look, I work at Risha's Brewery and I drink at the pub right alongside. He said, if you get in trouble, come and see me if you need anything. Mm. Anyway, I didn't think anything of that. But three days later, Philip's gone and taken most of the money. So here I am broke. And then when Bill and I met, I met Bill about two days later, when, um, when he mentioned this place to stay, I had no money, but I thought of Reg. And yes. so... Off I went, and he lent me the money. Oh. So you know, if we hadn't, it was a it was a thirty second decision between Philip and I. Do we stop for him? We've only just started our holiday, or don't we? Um, fortunately, Philip was very conscious about money, so he figured Reg had helped pay, so we stopped. Mm. But if we hadn't, I don't know where my life would have gone. I, I it's likely I would have had to have stolen or done mm. something else to get money to survive. Um, you say it, it's those little things that seem insignificant at the time, and right. yet what would yeah. life have turned out had it been? It's a sliding doors moment, isn't it, from that movie? It is, it? really. Yeah. Um, we could have kept going, and I would never have. I mean, apart from the fact that it was a wonderful travelling companion, full of stories and all sorts of things, that it was great to have him with us, and also very sensible, um, right. because it was much more mature than both Philip. Philip sure. was around. 18, 17, 18, because you could get your licence in those days at 16 in the Northern Territory. Um, and, um, and so I was 14 when we went to Sydney. And um, it was, it, you're right, it was one of those moments. And I've noticed those moments have happened in my life. Um, I'll tell you a story that it, it's probably not a sliding doors moment, but it shows you that I feel sometimes we are protected. We can be protected and we can have those moments. Um, when I was in Africa with a friend, we um, behind his house, um, there was this beautiful, well, this old cave and this hill. And we'd go there sometimes on weekends and just camp out because it was close to his house. We were safe. And, but we were, we were there and we'd build a little fire and we'd you know, do a little weekend thing. Anyway, he said to me uh, one day, very popular in Africa was mealy maize, which is like a porridge, um, easy to cook and very filling and obviously mm. cheap. So, but you use carnation milk. So we didn't have any. So we walked, he said, there's a little shop down this little path and we'll go. And so we walked to the shop and um, there's a chicken wire fence all the way along because there's a, a chicken run right, mm -hmm. right alongside it, along into our house. On the way back, he's in front of me um, and I'm walking and a snake comes through the fence and a rock slips and catches it and it's, probably no more than half an inch from my ankle oh. and quite and so he turned he's carrying a machete a little machete not a large one just, and he chops his head off and we cook it and eat it um oh, and right. I, okay well he he said oh i said to him, what about the poison if there is any i don't know what sort of snake it was i have no idea um he said well the, the poison's in the head it'll be fine yeah um, I, I don't know if that's true somebody may argue that it's not but anyway it tasted rubbery and it was very awful um but food. I what I'm saying is that those things happened all the time to me, mm. that they're close, but 
it didn't, you know, I mean, the snake, it could have been anything. I don't mm. know. Most of them are venomous in, in Africa. Not all of them, but most of them are. Um, and Did yes. it's the carnation milk. Uh, we he, we yeah, we were walking back. We had that. So we had mealy maize and snake for the, ah, for the, the barbecue. Over, over the open fire. Um, mm. And as I say, I, I wouldn't recommend snake. Um but it's just interesting that those things occur, and you're right. It's just that even though that's not insignificant, I guess my point there is that it always felt like there was some thing protecting me. It happened in in Sydney with incidents. We at late at night, I was when I was living in the boarding house. Um, I'd been to a dance with Bill and and some of the other boys, but some of the other boys decided to stay. And this is in a in a suburb called Campsie. And we're walking back to the railway station and, and Bill said, well, let's take a shortcut through the park. Now, in the 1970s in Sydney, um, in England, they would have been skinheads. In Sydney, they were called Sharpies. And both Bill and I, Bill had long blonde hair, looked like a surfy. I had long brown hair, but we were long hairs and they weren't particularly popular with Sharpies. And they'd, there'd been some at the dance. Um, and so anyway, when we were walking through, we saw one of them halfway into the park, one of them standing on the path in front of us. We could just make him out because um, they used to wear braces and sort of clothing like that. So they sometimes stood out very, and even though it's nighttime, we, we sort of recognised him. And he started, he put his fingers to his mouth and whistled. And Bill and I are both freaked out anyway. We know we've got it. And Bill's screaming, let's run. And next minute, Sharpies dropped from the trees. They were on the lower branches of the trees, four or five of them, and they dropped to the ground. And then Bill really <laughs> screams. Um, I won't say use the words. And anyway, so we just charge in sort of an odd an angle heading for where we think the station is, um, break out of the, the park. And um, it wasn't that big a park, but, but get there and the station and the trains just arriving. And so <laughs> Bill makes it through the turnstiles. I'm trying to get over them. I fall over flat on my face and the Sharpies are just behind. And then I have to dive in because we're talking about open rattling carriages of trains. So, they, you know, there's nothing fancy about these trains in Sydney yeah. at that stage. So I dive through the open door and slide across the other side. And fortunately, they didn't, the, the, the guy who was chasing us also got caught up on the turnstile. So they stopped and we, it, it rolled away and we made rude gestures to them hoping i mean if they got on we were dead um so yeah so these things happen you know um so to, quite an adventurous life and, and all of these tales are in the book aren't they yeah yeah they're all they're all there yeah so no need to buy the book now no no, no, no. i'm sure there's <laughs> even more there's even more so we've had that the the conversation with your daughter about leaving school at 13 was what prompted you to write the book is that right yeah great okay now, you've had a career of public speaking as well, though, haven't you, tucked away? Um, in Broadcasting, radio broadcasting. Broadcasting, yeah. okay. So Different to public speaking, though. Well, I can, I can honestly... Different public speaking in that you was in front of people. Well, you weren't in front of physical people. You were in front of a microphone that was in front yeah. of other people. Yeah. I can, and so for me, this wouldn't be for all broadcasters. Some of them love the public speaking but for me i can sit in a studio and broadcast to a million people if i was because i think of one person right and i remember when when i was working for what was known as the national broadcaster in australia the abc i was invited to speak at things like rotary groups and so on mm -hmm. put more than five or ten people in front of me and i'm a nervous wreck live right say. um and um um i haven't done any public speaking for a while now um but um but yes it's interesting but if you'd put me in a studio no problem no problem at all uh, uh, audience i want to pick up on that point remember in the introduction i was saying that the page can be fine it's your zone of genius you're, you're very comfortable in that position but the stage may be something entirely different well here you have in front of you somebody in exactly that same position the one person that he could think about now in this situation it's a podcast so you're talking to that one person and that is okay and then when you get familiar and comfortable with that 
you can start thinking about other people as well. Thank you, Graham, for sharing that, because that is actually very significant for our audience. Thank you. Thank you. So well, your so what would how would you say okay, let's let's backtrack on this for a minute. Your book came out in was it November twenty-three? October. October twenty three, apologies. October twenty three. Did you do much speaking around the launch time? I look, I didn't do as much as recommended. I didn't okay. I did a bit of social media. Mm -hmm. Um a lot of friends wanted the book and, and mm -hmm. I was happy to send them copies. Um, I did a couple of interviews um, and they were, um, but they were over the phone. So they, there was okay. no problem with that. However, what you're saying is, is, you know, is right. I mean, I need to break that mold. And so one of the things I wanted to do to start, and this is in a very small way, I've, I started to go to, I've been this year starting to go to markets, local markets to sell the book. Yes. and engage with people and it's even it's it's still a little a little push and show it's not completely comfortable mm -hmm. but um but that's what I've been doing and then one market that I went to just a small one on the weekend um was run by the Rotary Club who um uh came along saw what my book was about and they're very focused on trying to reduce domestic violence okay. um so they they said we'd love you to have you as a guest speaker so at one of our rotary meetings, so I'm um, arranging that. So I feel Ooh. more confident about talking about it, but again, I haven't been on stage yet to do it. So that will be an interesting time. Well, this is what, when, when I have um, particularly authors who go, oh, I, I don't do public speaking. My first question to them is, what's your definition of public speaking? Mm. And very often they'll say, well, it's, it's a raised platform and a microphone in hand and spouting forth. And again, it doesn't have to be. No. It's not no. the only platform available to you. And they go, oh. So there are different platforms available. As you pointed out with the social media stuff, you've got the virtual platform. Yes, you can be appearing on live interviews through social media. You can be appearing on virtual summits. Those are platforms in and of themselves. It doesn't have to be that classic stage situation. No, and I have I did record some YouTube videos about writing, not not about the um, the um, child inner child work, which is what my next step wants to be. Okay. So I I do have to learn to to engage with large audiences or both live and virtual, as you as you say. Virtual doesn't won't worry me. Even if it is a large audience, I still know that that will be my safe space. Yeah. But um, but I want to start working with men who have um, it primarily anger issues due to inner child trauma. So that's where I want to start working to try and help heal, which means I need to talk about that and I want to talk yeah. about that with larger groups. So it is it is something that I have to... Um, have to work on and, and see if I can go from, as you say, from the page to the stage. Page to stage, yes. Well, I mean, you, the, the work that you're proposing is so needed, so needed. My, my, for what it's worth, my observation of life is that there are so many families where if the father was present, it wasn't necessarily a good situation because of the father's own childhood mm. trauma that wasn't recognised. And with, with men having to be men and, and the um, suck it up and be strong and, and, oh, golly. So that inner child trauma is so, so needed. Because an awful lot of men, again, my observation, this is a generalisation, find it so difficult to be in that family situation because how can they be a father to the children, their children, when they didn't have a good role model. And when you don't have that good role model, the men are stuck. That's, that's absolutely right. I mean, my father, his background was he was given away with his sister at, at a very young age to this other couple who were very stern and showed him no love. So he he never showed love to any of us. He didn't know how to. Um, 
And so when we found out some of his background, I started to understand. But it is generational. It does yeah. come through generations. And people will argue that it doesn't. But you can have generational pain transferred. Um, we're fortunate in that. Um, I think I'm fortunate that I, I'm fortunate that I had the experiences I had. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't look at them as a negative because it allowed me at 13 to break my connection with my family, which mm -hmm. meant that as I grew into an adult, yes, I had lots of problems and I did. I had anger that would go from naught to 20 in the space of a second if said somebody triggered me, but until I learned about that, but um, but it meant that I was able to break away from that sort of generational thing. So raising my children is different. And my brother too, he he didn't mm. raise his um, very loving with his children and, and has mm. a relationship with them. So it is, you're right, it is really difficult if a man has had any type, and there's lots of variations of, of child trauma, as we know, it can be, it can be very minor, like somebody just saying, I don't like you in those clothes, or, you know, sit there and don't speak, which is one of the more common ones that, that mm -hmm. kids have faced, to, of course, the extremes. Um, but yes, if they haven't had good role models and had their boundaries at the right time, mm -hmm. how do they know what they are? How can they react? And also they have triggers that they don't know about. So if, if I could, I, I won't tell you the town because I don't want to identify it, but there, there was a, when I was working for the ABC, there was a little town um, not far from where I, we were based and a horrible incident took part where a man he would have been in his 60s, 60, 65. He took an ax to his, he was looking after his two grandchildren and his wife. And he's, I've never ever seen or heard why he did that. And I don't know that anybody had come to a reason. He didn't take his own life. Um, but what I'm, what I'm surmising, but what I would say is that there is probably this anger that men have that, can come out at any age. Just because you're 80 doesn't mean it's not going to come out. And it doesn't mean you're not going to do something completely horrific. I mean, men, older men are taking their own lives as well in, mm -hmm. in higher numbers. And a lot of that will be health and maybe finance even or loneliness. But a lot of it will be that this pain is starting to surface because mm -hmm. like, like um, returned service men and women, when they come back, they may come back and then the the things they've seen and done and had to endure start to come up yes. and, and, and take over their lives. And they get to a point, we have, you know, we have lots of sadly vets who, who take their own lives in this country and I'm sure in other countries yes. because it just gets overwhelming. There's no help for them. Um, and so it, it, I guess the point is, it doesn't matter what age you are, this stuff can come up and destroy you. Um, and yes, I mean, it, it, I would like to work with men to uh, primarily on anger, because that will you, you work through anger, shame, um, mm -hmm. sadness, you work through all of those things. And hopefully, if you can help them get over some of that, then they can have a much better life. And if you can get to younger men who've had difficulty in the early childhood imagine how much like if I had found what I found now 20 years ago mm. my life would have been so much better I probably would still be married so mm -hmm. I'm forced I probably would have still been able to maintain a, a proper relationship I've never been able to maintain a good relationship mm. um, and all of those things would have been such a better life mm -hmm. um, so you need to get to people young as well as try and help older people so yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, um, but it, yeah, it is really important. Just, I, I mean, I just feel it's something I can do because I've lived it, uh, know mm -hmm. what they're feeling, and mm -hmm. I have learned some skills and how to, um, how to help them heal. So I, it just feels right. You know, when something feels right. Yes, exactly. So let, let me get this right. The book was prompted by a conversation with your daughter. You're now thinking, come on, let, let, I, I need to share this. The book is, you can do so much with the book, but you can do an awful lot more yeah. when you when you stand up and speak about it. I look at the book as a stepping stone. Great, great. The okay. book for me, and, and also it gives me some, if, if somebody says, ah, oh, you may not know what I feel, I say, well, yeah, here, I'll send you my book free. Mm -hmm. 
and you can read it and you'll see what I've been through because there's been a, I, you know, we've covered a little bit of it, but there's a lot more in the book that happened to yes. me. So, yeah. um, so you, um, so I have lived the experience as well. So I know that the pain that they were, and I know the pain when it came out as mm. well. So it's not just the pain you suffer, but when it comes up, it's still painful yes. and it can drive you to do terrible things. Exactly. So, Yes, it's a stepping stone to the next step is actually working with men. Is working with with the guys now. So, are, are, you, are you doing some coaching work with them? Are you? How does this look in terms of continuing to to appreciate the 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 work that you are doing? What does that look yeah. like? It, it will be coaching. I'm, I'm looking at building um, a, a series of something like about 10 sessions per, mm -hmm. per person. Over uh, And because when you work with somebody, um, it can be quite painful. They need to sit in, the, in, in and let it come out. It would be a weekly, so it would be a 10-week program mm -hmm. where you work in, in trying to take them back to those moments, take them back to their childhood, so it is painful. Mm -hmm. And they have to go right back into that and, and give them then um, the ability I can help then help them clean some of that up. Mm -hmm. And then um, it also helps them manage um, what I want to do is, and I know it happens for me, manage the anger when it comes up. So I don't think you get rid of any of these child, inner child issues altogether. I think they always, you have elements within your nervous system, within your body. They're all through you because it's what you lived. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is as your nervous system says, okay, this is a trigger for me. This person um, is making noise over there and that triggers me. Instead of reacting and yelling at the person to be quiet or, or, or getting into a confrontation, what you end up doing is, okay, I can calm this down now. I can control this nervous reaction mm -hmm. and I feel better. And that's that's what I want to get men so to be able to do. Having a conscious strategy when you recognise a trigger of going, that would have been the way I would in the past have gone, but this mm. is the way I'm choosing to go now. That's correct, yeah. Got it, got and, it. And it, it is much healthier for them. And of course, when you realize that you can do that, you can you apply that to everything you do. Yes. You know, like like um, if if for example, one one of the uh, and this is a really maybe silly thing, but whenever I would go to a coffee shop, if I saw a long line of people, I would get all anxious because they were waiting. I wanted to get to my coffee straight away. Now mm -hmm. it's a silly silly thing, and I don't know where it came from because it wasn't always like that. Um, so I had to work on calming myself and saying, that's okay, get your coffee when you do. Now it doesn't matter. Mm. But it gave me, I needed a strategy. That uh, It's a very simple thing and I know people might laugh, but it actually did, I would avoid coffee shops with people, long lines. I would go early before people would get there, all of these sorts of things to avoid it. So it gives you strategies to help yourself in, in all ways. What you've shared with us then, is that you can actually, it doesn't have to be the big rocks. No, no. It can be, be the little small. pebbles as well. Yes. Mm. And sometimes they're the worst because sometimes you ignore them and say, ah, and, and they grow. Um, so, no, the, the big ones we know we should do something about. The small ones are the ones where we might leave them and, and they can also be very much a problem. Um, so, yes, you're right. It, it can certainly be the small ones that are, are as much an issue as, you know, the ones that obviously when they come up are, are huge. The way the way I like to think of that in terms of the small ones is like the, the classic metaphor of, a, of um, yeast in dough. It just needs a tiny little bit of yeast, but oh boy. It can mm -hmm. affect the whole, well, that's the idea it does. It, it makes the whole thing rise. But if that's on a negative perspective, that's when, if you can identify what that yeast is and go, no, thank you. We can take that one out and put something instead. Yeah. That's right. Replace it with a good a good emotion, feeling good okay. about yourself. Um, okay. Yeah, and that, that, that's exactly right. It, it's, I mean, it's the same, you know, if you want to talk about the old pebble in the water and the ripples that take effect. 
Um, if it's a good ripple, then that's wonderful. But of course, sometimes it's not. So yeah. Those ripples sometimes are negative and they do ripple through your body and they affect other things. And that's, um, you know, people, you're right about men don't always come forward, although there is a lot more talk about inner child trauma. Um, but yeah, you do need to, um, you do need to work on it. And, and I, you know, I'm hopeful that that's, that's the next career path for me. I mean, uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm just going to interject here. We had a, one of our TEDx speakers a couple of years ago. He heads up the Man Up Project in Perth, and he's going into high schools to say to the young lads, particularly, you know, the, the macho ones, he goes, yeah, come on, boys, this is something that you need to consider. It's not the, the, the macho thing's one thing, but the suck it up, and he actually tells the tale of his cousin who was maintaining the bravado even the day before the conversation he had with with this guy even the day before he committed suicide so nobody could see it coming and that's especially uh, that's really the age you need to get to kids yeah. get to young men um and uh, even if they just think about it even if you just plant a seed and it's a bit like your yeast example it's mm -hmm that seed will then grow as they see things that they do you hope that that seed will go oh okay this is yeah and it has to be like that because um you have to get to those young men because then that will give them such a better life i can't tell you how much better i am now five years on from writing the book and getting the help during that period to what i was five years ago was a totally different person um and um it's just it it is like chalk and cheese the difference mm. wow. wow thank you so much for sharing that my pleasure so what well, finally as we're winding up i know you're, you're not overly happy with the stage bit yet but on the podcast on the broad i'm, I'm going to ask you have you done much talking about the book I, only, I know we said a few things but how do you feel about sharing that information we, we've just shared a podcast together my question i'm getting to is how do you embody your words from page onto the stage i um i am very uh, this is something that uh, people ask me they say oh you're brave to do this you're this and, and that's not really what it is it's about wanting to share my story because i want to get to men and i'm very happy to share I mean, there are far worse elements in the book than we've spoken about. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm very happy to share all of it. It's all out there for, um, as an example of, yes, all these things happened to me, but um, ultimately I've realised that it came from that very moment at five. That's where it started. And um, if you can go to somebody and talk to them and find out and help them, that's huge. And so sharing my story on a stage, um, I look at it, it would, that's why I wrote it in the second person to take them into it, to take them along that journey. And I would try to do the same on stage. I would try to take them into those moments. So I'd have to be a bit more um, articulate than I've been today, but I would have to give them, select the stories and take them into exactly how they happened and, and mm. give them, paint the pictures for them. And then at the end, really talk about this has all been driven. These things, this, I mean, some of the things I put myself on, you know, I had a man sexually assault me with a knife at my throat um, in a Darwin hotel. Um, and so, you know, these things, but I put myself in those positions. I realise now that I didn't care whether I lived or died because of where I was coming from. Yeah, so, what have you got to lose? Yeah, so, you know, these are the things. So I want to talk to groups about that and then, you know, talk about helping as well. That yeah. The idea would then be, but there is help. And the same with vets, returned servicemen and women. I'd yes. like, you know, inner child trauma is very close in terms of the the sort of reactions you have to PTSD very close so um it's and, almost chronic ptsd yeah. isn't it because it, it's not a a specific situation i mean you went through where are we five to 13 eight um eight years of continuous 
and that's chronic traumatic experiences and you you relive it you, you know mm. because things trigger you but but those who have been through wars and through those sorts of things they have deep 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 wounds and yes. they come out and of course you, your story about the, the young boy who took his own life well that's what happens to them they get to a point where people don't recognize that some may but they don't know how to help them they're at the point and so they need to um, then they need help and um, a lot of people don't and because of course the army navy and, and air force attract quite a macho set of men and women yes. who, who are right you know we, we don't need help so that but they do when they come out of that scenario they do but um yeah exactly exactly i was talking with one of my, my other guests recently who had been hostage and so we again we were talking about the the PTSD from that. Mm -hmm. So yes, I mean there there are lots of situations that can arise where the trauma, and as you mentioned earlier, we've all experienced trauma of some sort, whether or not we choose to label it, because that that's when you you start getting into the comparison. Oh, I've got nothing on you. Well, no, I'm not asking you to compare your story with mine. No. Whatever we have been through that we consider traumatic was traumatic. That's right. And it, it doesn't have to be the extreme of being in a war zone or, or the extreme with me being beaten uh, um, or whatever. It can, can be very different to that. And yeah. But it's still, I mean, you know, there is, um, there is a lot of work being done around um, kids who had to be the caregivers for their parents. Like they may have had an alcoholic father or mother um mm -hmm. and they had to look after the other the other mm -hmm. adult in the in the house and they were never allowed to be a child so um that brings all sorts of issues um mm -hmm. for them as they grow up in terms of relationships and and many of them may even turn uh, to alcohol as or, or drugs and that's the other thing people turn to drugs and alcohol to fill that hole that they don't know what the hole is it's just there inside them they don't understand and they they, they fill it with those things as you say, it's a very large topic. And it is. And, you're and going it, for a little slice yeah. of it, which I totally honour you for, sir. Thank you so much. Is there anything that we've missed off as we're winding up? No, no, I um no, it's been a lovely conversation and it's been great, great conversation. Um and um yes, hopefully um I um will see you along the journey of podcasting and and maybe on stage somewhere looking forward to it looking forward to it graham so thank you so much for sharing with our audience your from page to stage for now bye from us bye